are starting, I want to acknowledge that the Edmonton Public Library and the, the University of Alberta is located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Salto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant communities. As we explore energy systems, specifically tonight, batteries, it's essential that we acknowledge the territories, communities, and peoples that have been essential partners in this work. We are truly grateful to have the opportunity to work, study, live, and enjoy tonight with you on this land. So first I wanna introduce myself, where we come from, and then I'll be passing it to our amazing speakers. Uh, so my name is Valerie Miller. I'm the Outreach Coordinator for Future Energy Systems at the University of Alberta. Who has heard of future energy sp systems in this space? We have Sam in the background and my two researchers. Awesome. So, okay, we've got some people who've heard of it, but Future Energy Systems for Anyone Else was launched in 2016 with $75 million from the federal government uh, from the Canada First Research Excellence Fund, or CFREF, to help Canada transition to a low net, car net carbon energy economy. And we focus on multidisciplinary research that develops the energy technologies of the near future, integrates them into today's infrastructure, and examines possible consequences for the economy, environment, and society. We also contribute to the development of solutions for the challenges related to current energy systems. We have over 100 research projects, over 150 researchers, over 900 grad students, postdocs, and other highly qualified personnel uh, who are all studying different questions, and you get to meet two of them this evening. Uh, for those of you watching on the camera, we wish to remind current and future viewers of this that the opinions expressed by the speakers are not necessarily those of the Edmonton Public Library, the University of Alberta, or future energy systems. So I'm gonna get Matt to come up, but just while he does, just gonna let you know that the next talk from hot to cold uh, urban heat islands are still in effect will be November 23rd and that one will be online because it's November in Edmonton and it's very cold sometimes. So that one will be back online uh, exploring questions like, do all neighborhoods experience the same urban heat island effect? Has this phenomenon changed over the last two decades? Are there thermal inequalities between communities and what is the impact of that? And we will be joined by Dr. Sandeep Agrawal and Dr. Nalusha Welgadera to answer some of those questions. So we encourage you to sign up for that. This will be, I mean, all of the talks are very interesting, but this one will be, again, a very interesting talk to join. Uh, uh, it will be online. Uh, so you can watch it live with us with the Edmonton Public Library, uh, or you can watch it later on the YouTube channel. Uh, and at the end, uh, we wanna hear from you. So do you want back in person, we've heard very clearly from some folks that they want to continue in-person talks. So let us know at the end of the session so that we can work on developing the 2023 programming. So Matt, I'm going to get you to come get your presentation up and going. For everyone, uh, how today is going to go, we have two speakers. Matthew LeBay will be starting and presenting some of his research. We'll be pausing for some questions from you. And then Anil Kumar will be coming up and talking about his research. We'll pause for some questions. And then we're going to do a little bit of a room change and set up our speakers at the front to answer any questions that you have. And we'll have a bit of a Q&A. Everybody good, we're ready. Awesome, then I'm gonna pass it over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Valerie. Hello, everyone. Uh, I, as she said, my name is Matthew LeBay. I'm a PhD student at the University of Alberta in the Department of Chemical and Materials Engineering. And I'd like to talk today about how you can use rust to power your car. Or in other words, uh, using iron oxide, uh, also known as rust, uh, and other earth abundant materials uh, as catalysts in zinc air batteries. So the main key focus of my research has to do with energy storage. And before I talk about energy storage, I want to talk about energy in itself and how energy has different forms. So recall back to high school maybe for some of you uh, that there's different kinds of energy. So thermal energy, for example, is just heat. The molecules move around really fast. Uh, electrical energy, it's in all the walls when we're plugging in our TV or 
things like that. Uh, there's gravitational potential energy. That's one type. That's when you have water elevated above ground. And when we let it fall, it converts from potential to kinetic energy, right? So different changes between energies. Uh, and lastly, also chemical energy. This is like bonds and chemicals, but also can be understood as batteries. The batteries have chemical bonds. And so that's energy stored in those bonds. And so we can convert between these different types of energy. And that's useful because we can't store the electrical energy in the grid, but we can store chemical energy in bonds. So we're converting between these different types depending on needs. Unfortunately, these conversions are never 100%. So we're going to have some losses. So today I'll be talking about efficiency a lot. When I say efficiency, I'm talking about how if we go from electrical to chemical, we stored it for a while, we go back to electrical to power a car, for example, um, we have some sort of loss. And so that's going to be the efficiency value. So why do we need energy storage? Well, one good use for that is an electrical grid, it's especially renewable-based grids. So if we have a solar panel, panel uh, or wind turbine or things that are intermittent, right? So we don't always have our renewable energy. What we can do is when it's working great, we have plenty of sunlight, we use it to power our homes. Everything's great, everything's good. Um, but we're gonna have excess. Actually, it's quite all common that during the middle of the day, when everyone's at work, and we're not really using much power, the sun's giving us more than we need. So we can take that excess and throw it into energy storage. And in this case, I'm talking about batteries. It's a very versatile option. Uh, and so when we have this, we can fill up a battery with any excess. And then when the sun goes away, or say the, the wind dies down, we don't have that energy going into the grid that's renewable. But we have that stored renewable energy in that battery. So we can take that energy out and still maintain a carbon neutral energy grid, avoiding the fossil fuel burning. So that's a good application of energy storage. Um, Another one is also in portable electronics. So your phone, right? And also electric vehicles, that's what EV stands for. So your cars, everyone knows, ever heard about the new electric vehicles. You know, there's mandates now to have a whole bunch of them and they're using a lot of lithium ion batteries, right? That is the go-to energy storage in terms of batteries right now. Now I wanna to talk today about a different battery chemistry called a zinc air battery. The zinc air battery is just that, it's zinc and it's air. Uh, the zinc is just a solid piece of zinc metal, and the air is in the form of oxygen. That's the reactive species. And so we want to get energy out of a battery. So we want to discharge, we want to power our car. Um, the zinc turns into something called zinc oxide. It stays in the battery. Uh, and then oxygen comes in from the air into our battery system, and it can, gets converted, a chemical reaction occurs, and we get electrons flowing, so we get power out of that. And if you want to add energy into a battery, recharge it, we just reverse those reactions. That zinc oxide goes back to zinc, and oxygen gets produced and leaves the battery. And that's a key port, port, important part there, is that the oxygen does not stay in the battery. We store the zinc, we store that electrolyte, that liquid-based solution, but we don't store the air. And so when we're talking about uh, how much energy we have per, per weight or per volume, zinc air batteries are pretty good because we don't store half of it. So that's a big draw, a big, big attraction of zinc air batteries is a high energy density. Now these zinc air batteries might sound kind of unfamiliar, but they're actually commercialized in the store right now. Um, now only the discharge version, we can't recharge them quite yet, but the discharge versions are hearing aid batteries. And the reason we're using for hearing aid batteries is because the oxygen reaction has some difficulties. And as a result, we don't get a lot of power out of the battery right now, but the power is enough for a hearing aid. And if we're using a zinc air versus say a double A battery, we get almost five times more lifetime out of a single battery because we're not storing that air, right? The air just comes in. So we're just storing the zinc. So we get more energy density, as it's known, from a zinc air battery versus other battery chemistries. But it's important to compare the zinc air batteries versus everyone's go-to lithium ion batteries. So lithium ion batteries use something called intercalation. It's really just lithium ions going back and forth between a positive and negative electrode. And as a result, that's a very simple reaction. So it's really reversible, but doesn't store a lot of energy. So we're talking energy densities, right? I'm comparing lithium ion to zinc air. Energy densities, we're talking theoretically about five times more in a zinc air compared to lithium ion. Because of lith zinc airs have a chemical reaction. We're converting oxygen into a different species, right? Zinc is turning to zinc oxide. It's not as simple. Um, another interesting uh, or attraction of zinc air batteries is cost. Uh, there's, you could more figures involved with safety concerns and, and packaging, but just looking at a simplification of the cost of zinc metal versus lithium metal, you can see here that we're talking a magnitude of order difference. 
So zinc is much more abundant than lithium. And some of you might have heard that there's issues right now with lithium, trying to get enough lithium for lithium ion batteries. Well, zinc is plentiful, and actually Canada's a pretty big producer. So it's a good thing to start using some zinc for Canada. Another thing is safety. Uh, lithium ion batteries don't have any water in them because lithium is reactive with water. Um, and as a result, they have something that's more flammable. So that electrolyte there in pink is going to, if it ruptures, can cause those fires for, for lithium ion batteries. Whereas zinc air, zinc is fairly stable in water, so we can use a water based liquid. And so it's a lot safer. Now, I mentioned there's a lot of good positives of zinc air, but because the reactions are chemical, big chemical reactions, not just a simple back and forth, it's a bit more difficult for it to happen. So we have energy losses. So that efficiency value is more along 60% for zinc air versus greater than 90 for lithium ion. So that's one of the drawbacks what we're working on right now in zinc air batteries. Another one is a lifetime. So lithium ion batteries, again, very simple, no issues going back and forth. It can do that almost 20,000 times in a battery. So a lot of charging, discharging. Zinc air batteries, right now, the best ones are around 1,000 cycles. So those are the two main aspects I like to try to improve in my research, is the efficiency values for each charge discharge and the lifetime of the battery. Now, to enhance these things, to, to make it better, I'll use something called a catalyst. What's a catalyst? Well, a catalyst is just something that enhances a chemical reaction. So here is the oxygen reaction that's happening in the battery. This is where a lot of the troubles come in zinc air batteries. We lose a lot of energy here. Um, so going from left to right, that's getting energy out of the battery. That's discharging it. Going from right to left, that's when we're getting it back, right? We just reverse the reaction. And if you want to proceed in that reaction, we've got to go over an energy hump. It's called a, you can see there on the curve, right? There's an energy barrier. And so that excess energy we need to add to exceed that barrier kind of gets lost. That's where we lose efficiency values. If I can add a catalyst though, the right catalyst, we can reduce that energy barrier, that hump. And so then we can have less energy required to get over the hump and therefore a better efficiency. Now, unfortunately, the go-to catalyst for a long time right now has been platinum or ruthenium or iridium. These are really expensive. They're very rare. They're precious metals. Um, looking at like a price basis for platinum, we're talking like 30,000 per kilogram. But what if we could use something like rust, which is more like, oh, I don't know, 10 cents per kilogram, much cheaper, right? And interestingly enough, iron oxide or rust does show activity towards this reaction. So a lot of promise. Uh, and then on the right there, I have a periodic table, which shows abundance values in the Earth's crust. So looking at kind of, okay, how much of us do we have to work with, right? And so again, platinum, it's expensive. I said it's rare. We're talking I don't know, 0 0.005 milligrams of this element per every kilogram of soil on average. Whereas iron is more like 50,000. So much, much more iron to play around with. Uh, and if you're curious, uh, lithium is up there about 20 milligrams per kilogram. So that's an okay number. Whereas zinc is 70. So we're talking maybe three times more zinc than lithium. So again, that's another benefit of this technology. Now, unfortunately, I can't just take rust that's on my car, throw it in a battery and call it a day. I got to do some work here. Um, so I do a nano engineering technique called atomic layer deposition or ALD, I'll call it for now. And it's a layer by layer growth technique. So what that means is that I have a solid surface and I'll introduce a gas species. And so this gas will have my iron oxide and it will react with the surface and deposit an atomic layer, one atomic layer of my material. And that's it. And then I'll do another cycle and I'll do another the next layer and so on and so forth. So a similar way we have these rock formations over periods of years and years and years, I can create a material layer by layer over a period of seconds, right? So it's a lot more reasonable. Uh, and on the far right there, that's the instrument I use to make my catalysts. So you can see it's pretty large because there's a lot of gas flows, a lot of um, instruments to check how thick is it, right? So there's a lot of involved process. Uh, and it's pretty well established in the semiconductor industry for making their films on semiconductors, like their uh, microchips. But this is kind of a novel application of the technology. Now, with this technology, this ALD, I can make iron oxide catalysts that are better than just throwing iron oxide rust on my, my battery. Because if we just threw chunks of it, we might block pores in that air electrode. We need air, oxygen in and out of the battery. If we block those pores, it's not going not gonna to work anymore. And also, I can enhance my surface area. Now, catalyst surface area is everything because of the, the catalyst actually works on the surface. So the more surface area, the more reactions you're going to have catalyzed. So with my ALD, uh, you can see on the right there, that's schematic. 
I get a thin conformal coating of iron oxide of my rust catalyst all through the particles of my air electrode. That's kind of just like what the air electrode looks like. So that enhances the performance, enhances the uh, utilization, so don't waste material. Now, when I was doing my research though, I came upon a problem. So this is the molecule that I use, the gas-based molecule called ethylpherosine. It's cheap, it's abundant, it's great. Um, to make iron oxide, I had to break those carbon the iron carbon bonds. So you something called oxygen plasma. Now it's great at destroying the carbon bonds and giving me iron oxide, giving me that rust. However, I throw it on my battery, looking at just the air electrode, that same oxygen plasma is great at destroying my carbon-based air electrode. So that's not a really good thing. That's some problem there. So a solution was to have kind of a buffer layer, a protective layer. And so I'm looking at manganese. Now I forgot to mention this earlier, but if we go back to the uh, periodic table, manganese is the neighbor to iron. It's also very abundant in the earth. So it's also a earth abundant material that I can use in my research. And in this case, when I'm using my big manganese molecule there, I don't need oxygen plasma. I can use something called forming gas plasma. It's a hydrogen, nitrogen mixture. It's a bit softer, more mild on my air electrode. And so I can deposit a thin layer, just a little, little bit of manganese oxide to protect the carbon surface of my air electrode and then do my oxygen plasma with my iron to give me my iron oxide catalyst. And that will give me my catalyst without destroying my battery. So pretty good uh, workaround. Uh, and this is just results of throwing that catalyst into the battery and seeing how it performs. And in this test, we're looking at to get more current with lower potential. So we want to get um, kind of right here would be perfect, <laughs> but the closer to the right, the more current we can get better. So we're looking at blue is if nothing, just no catalyst. It's not, it's okay. Uh, red is my iron oxide. So we've improved our current with lower potentials. So we're getting better efficiency in a certain sense. The reaction is speeding up. Now black there, that's platinum. That's the go-to catalyst they talked about earlier. So I'm a little bit away from platinum. So there's some work to be involved there. However, that's only for discharging. That's getting energy out of battery. To get energy back in the battery, we're doing recharge. It's a different, we're doing the backwards reaction. And in that case, looking at platinum versus my iron oxide, after a certain potential, I can get more current with my iron oxide. So my iron oxide is actually more active towards that recharging reaction than say the platinum or ruthenium oxide, those precious metals. So that's very promising. On the right there are X-ray maps of my material. So what we do is we look at my material. This is nanoscale, right? And we use electron microscopes to look at it. And the electrons will interact with the sample and give me X-rays. Those X-rays have energy that's kind of like a fingerprint to each element. And so we can map out the energies of each fingerprint of each element uh, and see the distribution of it. So the white is just the carbon particles of my air electrode. And then blue is oxygen, red's iron. And you can see that the oxygen and iron are overlapping and we get that thin coating around all the particles that I showed earlier in my schematic. So I'm getting what I should have. And there's some manganese signal as well because of that buffer layer I used. So discharge could be improved. Well, it just so happens that the manganese oxide I'm using actually is a catalyst towards the discharge reaction. Somebody before me was doing their work on manganese oxide for the discharge only. So I thought, well, maybe get both, best of both worlds by having more manganese or going back and forth between manganese and iron, right? Maybe make some sort of super cycle. And so that's exactly what I did. I mixed manganese and iron oxide. So I deposit the manganese first, because again, it's softer towards my carbon, a thin layer of manganese oxide, and then I'll deposit my iron oxide. But I'm doing this at a higher temperature, so 150 Celsius. And as a result, when I'm depositing, so I deposit maybe like 10 atomic layers of manganese, and then I do 10 atomic layers of iron. And because it's elevated temperature, and these are atomic layers, they're gonna start mixing as I deposit it. So I'm gonna start getting a mixed oxide, a mixed manganese iron oxide. And the two of them can kind of intermix, and it's not one or the other, like layers, it's a complete mixture. And then I repeat the manganese, repeat the iron, repeat the manganese, do the chemistry, that's the best ratio for what I want. So I did just that, and we look at the results, looking at the discharge reaction, right, energy out of the battery, red's my iron, green is just manganese by itself, purple is that mixture. So somehow we've actually improved the discharge better than either on their own. So we have something called a synergistic benefit, where they work together as a mixed oxide 
to be better than themselves. Um, platinum's in the black, so we're close to platinum. We're doing a pretty good job here. However, look in the recharge reaction. Somehow we've lost the potential. So the, the iron there in red is doing great. The purple down there, not quite as good. So somehow the mangy has gotten in the way of the irons working for the recharge. So it's still a work in progress to get the best, the best of both worlds. Uh, and then we're mapping it, the x-rays. Again, you see oxygen, iron, manganese, and they're all overlapping, right? They're not layer, layer, layer. It's all one mixed oxide. That's great news. So that's me working on the efficiency values. But what about the cycle life? I thought, well, maybe that manganese iron oxide is stable. Maybe something about it is just very well. So I tried it in a cycling test. So in this test that I do here, I just recharge battery and then discharge it. Recharge it, discharge it. Do it over and over again, just accelerated testing um, for 100 hours. Right? So that's 200 cycles in my case. And I compared that for no catalyst in blue, the platinum and ruthenium oxide, the go-to precious metal catalyst in black, and mine in the purple. And the very first cycle, the very first time I do it, you can see there, platinum, again, is better than my uh, AOD catalyst. We thought that would be the case. Um, but as I go through more and more cycles, that platinum starts to deviate away. Right? It starts to get worse and worse efficiency values. My manganese oxide, my mixed manganese iron oxide, rather, is completely stable. Right? That's a straight line pretty well. Um, so at the very end, after 100 hours, the efficiency values for my manganese oxide, or manganese iron oxide, rather, uh, is actually higher than the platinum ruthenium oxide. So now it's actually a better battery after 100 hours of cycling. Now, my work right now is trying to see if we can get past that. I just stopped the test. I could have kept blowing, probably. So we're going to find out how much better this is. Uh, so yeah, just to recap, I am like to take rust or other earth abundant materials uh, as a catalyst in a zinc air battery. And that zinc air battery can then be used one day to power your electric vehicle. And I'd like to thank uh, my uh, supervisors, Dr. Douglas Ivey, uh, and my colleagues in that research group, as well as Ken Cadian and colleagues in that group, as well as funding for my research from the University of Alberta Fez Project, who sponsored tonight, uh, as well as NSERC from the Government of Canada. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I've got my own questions, but the floor is open to questions from you all. We're going to pause probably about five minutes just to take a couple, and then we'll head into our second talk and then come back. So you got lots of time to think about your questions, but does anyone have a burning question right now that they really want to know the answer to before we move on? So while you're thinking... Uh, I had a question about, are there any other combos you want to test? So you've looked at uh, iron and mang manganese. manganese, not magnesium, uh, but are there other combinations that you think could have potential that you're maybe thinking about? It's a very good question, Valerie. Thank you. Um, so if I actually show you guys, go back to my PR table, another PR table, so useful. Um, so this right here, they're called transition metals. This is a big group of the go-to catalysts. Um, and beside iron, we have manganese, right? That was what I was trying. But what about its neighbor? Cobalt, or maybe nickel, or copper, or zinc, right? So those are all things that people are trying for catalysts. And so when I'm looking at my research, it's what can I do with ALD? Because not everything can be done with ALD. And what is a good catalyst? Now, cobalt is being used right now with lithium, with lithium ion, and it's got problems with like resources and trying to get it. Um, but uh, zinc is abundant, right? It's also the zinc air battery. And other people in my group who work on zinc air batteries found that when we cycle it after about 100 hours or whatever, right, right, long tests, what happens is there's zinc in the electrolyte that makes its way into the catalyst and makes it a zinc-based catalyst. So I thought, what if we just add it in the first place? And so that's like what I'm working on right now is deliberately adding zinc to the mix and increasing the stability even more. So that's the element I'm looking at is zinc. Um, but like I said, cobalt also has some activity and nickel as well. So those are the elements that you look at. Awesome. Uh, anyone else before I jump in with another one? Because you just brought up uh, the layer deposition. Anyone else? Yeah, hold on. Let me bring you. Uh, is there any potential for uh, just having separate electrodes for recharging and discharging? Yes, that's a very good idea. That has been done. It's, we call that tri-electrode. Because we've got, we've got two electrodes for 
the, the air reaction and then one electrode for that zinc. So it's tri-electrode. And yes, you're right, because because that recharging back and forth can cause degradation and loss. What if you had one just for charging and one just for discharging? And like I said, catalyst, like just the iron oxide for recharging and just your manganese or even the mixture uh, for discharging. And you're right, that is an application people are looking at. Um, it it kind of makes it more of a complicated battery because now you've got an extra electrode, um, but it does help in performance. So that's definitely an option. My research, I want to try to find what's called a bifunctional catalyst, what does both jobs, and it makes the battery a little bit more compact and user directly. But for sure, you're right. That's a, a good option to go to to enhance the batteries, to make them separate electrodes. Awesome. Anyone else? Okay, you got lots of time after, but my next question, my last question is, you were talking about doing like 10 layers of iron and then 10 layers and then 10 layers. Are you looking at the number of layers that you need to put down of these different materials? Is that part of the research or is there kind of like a standard number of layers that you need? It's a very good question. And no, it's not standardized. Um, so that was part of my research. I didn't want to show all that. That would take two hours. Um, but I went through optimizing how thick should it be? How much iron? How much manganese? How thick should the manganese before I do iron, right? And so these are all parameters I played with. Um, and so actually this, the samples I'm showing you right now are what I call 3010. So I do 30 cycles of my manganese oxide process to give me, I don't even know how thick it is per se, angstroms. We're talking about like tenth of a nanometer. Uh, so, you know, a fraction of a nanometer, uh, 30 cycles of manganese. And then I'll do 10 cycles of iron. And then I'll do 10 cycles, 30, 30 of manganese and then 10 iron. Then 30 manganese and 10 iron. So that's my process that I, I optimized. I tried 10, 10, I tried 20, 20, right? So you're right, it's not standardized and it is a whole process to figure it out. Endless questions when it comes yeah. to research. Well, let's give Matt another round of applause and he will be back to answer more questions. But thank you, Matt. And we're gonna bring our second speaker up. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Anil Kumar. I'm a graduate student at the uh, UFA. I'm working under Dr. Zhao Liwang in the NanoPhase Lab. And my research focuses on creating a circular economy for lithium-ion batteries uh, via recycling and regeneration. So before I get into what I do, I'll just uh, touch upon why I do it. And I think uh, Matt mentioned uh, a bit about that as well. So the contents of these images, we're all familiar with them, and I'm sure we want at least a couple of them. It depict two revolutions that's happening right now. One is the digital revolution and, and the other is the uh, green revolution. Uh, if you look at the images in the corners, the uh, portable electronic devices, they're part of the uh, digital revolution, especially the smartphones and the laptops. Uh, we can't imagine going a day without that, right? And um, yeah, so naturally the demand for these is uh, sort of increasing as the days goes by. And uh, I'm sure this will be a trend in the upcoming future as well. And in terms of the green revolution, if you take uh, look at the images in the center. The top depicts the uh, depicts an electric vehicle, and as Matt mentioned, uh, they are powered by lithium-ion batteries. All of them are, uh, essentially, and um, their proliferation is uh, kind of uh, picking up uh, as their prices become more accessible. And of course, uh, grid-scale energy storage. When we use uh, alternative energy such as uh, solar and wind, they're intermittent in nature and uh, highly dependent on the weather. So when we're harvesting, we need a means to store them and energy storage uh, devices, grid scale energy storage devices powered by lithium ion batteries uh, form is very critical to it. Now, the overlapping trend in all of these, first, of course, they're all powered by lithium ion batteries. That's the backbone of it. And the second is that the demand for this is increasing. So naturally, when the demand for the application increases, so does the demand for the lithium ion battery. And if you take it one step back, so does the demand of the base metals or raw materials used to produce it, namely lithium and cobalt. And uh, of course, this poses a, a logistical issue. And if we try to quantify that a little bit, so if you look at the first graph, graph A, this shows the uh, application distribution for the metal lithium. And in the last decade, uh, uh, batteries have sort of a monopoly on it. And um, uh, of course, that's uh, to be expected. And uh, if you take the question of uh, demand and supply, uh, the same authors, they did a, a prediction-based model, and they found that uh, a, a threshold point or a critical point in the future the demand for the uh, metal is going to outpace uh, supply. And of course, there's the associated economic fallout of that and so on. So uh, what's the uh, knee-jerk reaction when the supply of something uh, reduces? What do we do? We try to increase the supply, right? However, uh, in terms of lithium-ion batteries, it's uh, or the base metal lithium and cobalt, it's a bit uh, challenging, simply because if you look at the uh, 
graph on the uh, right, four countries uh, produce more than 90% of the lithium. So lithium in itself is not a scarce metal. It is abundant. But exploitably, uh, like economically exploitable reserves of lithium is uh, sort of limited. So um, what I'm trying to say here is that relying on mining alone uh, for the supply of the base materials to produce lithium ion batteries is maybe not the uh, best strategy. And of course, uh, increasing the supply of lithium through primary extraction, be it just mining or something like that, uh, uh, introduces other constraints as well, such as uh, ethical, technical, as well as uh, uh, environmental ones. And this is a brief overview of uh, all three of them. Uh, the central part, of course, is that to extract one ton of lithium, you need about 500 gallons of water, which is a lot. The reason for that is the technology right now to extract lithium is uh, something called evaporative technology, especially in uh, uh, South America and the lithium uh, triangle, as they call it in South America, which includes, I believe, uh, Chile, Argentina, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, Peru. So what they do is they take brines rich in the better lithium, pump it into a pond, and then sort of evaporate it. So the evaporated water, it's not collected, it's just lost. And this uh, is not you know, suitable for the uh, local uh, environment. And of course, uh, there are other environmental impacts associated with it. For instance, lithium is a heavy metal. So uh, the metal is found in the effluents and the runoffs. And uh, this could accumulate in ecosystems. And once it reaches living organisms, it can have biophysical effects. In terms of humans, it can affect our uh, neurological systems. That's a, a very important concern. And finally, of course, the uh, reagents used for its treatment, such as hydrochloric acid and uh, nitric acid, uh, if they are part of the runoff or the effluents, they sort of affect the uh, soil and water pH, which could upend exos uh, ecosystems and affect the uh, local uh, flora and fauna. In terms of the ethical aspect, uh, so if you take cobalt, for instance, a very important constituent of lithium ion batteries, they're mostly um, mined from uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And as I mentioned earlier, the metal lithium, they come from the uh, sailors in South America. And uh, these are developing countries and there is uh, exploitation of labor that's going on. And when the demand pressure applies to it, this is going to, uh, I would say, grow tenfold. And, uh, that is uh, not ideal. And thirdly, of course, there's the uh, technical constraint. So um, processing uh, plants to bring these uh, metals to battery grade, uh, they have a limited capacity. And growing that capacity is not immediate. You need some time for that to happen. So what I'm trying to say from all of this is that relying on uh, mining alone or relying on uh, primary extraction is not a suitable strategy for uh, to uh, satiate the demand for lithium that we have as the next energy transition is coming along. So uh, that's where uh, I come in and the principle of uh, circular economy comes in. So the essentially what a circular economy implies or the princi base principle of a circular economy is that the raw materials are kept in the supply chain for as long as possible by using uh, by reusing, uh, recycling, refurbishing, all the re's that you can think of. And um, the another key principle is that it looks to minimize waste and pollution. Now, it should be noted that this is a bit aspirational. However, this is a, a model that uh, I believe all production si uh, systems should aspire uh, to. And uh, yeah, also, yeah, complete, uh, uh, like we cannot eliminate waste generation per se, simply because there are too many parts for a product and also uh, entropic losses, of course. So how does this uh, fit into a, a lithium ion battery? So now, as I mentioned, the whole principle is to have a secondary supply uh, chain for lithium from the spent uh, or used batteries. So that's like an, uh, an untapped potential, I would say. So for a lithium ion battery, this is how a typical circular economy would work. So let's take the example of an electric vehicle. So there's a battery in it, and when its capacity dips by around 20%, it cannot be used in that application anymore. But that does not mean the battery is completely dead. There's, it has, still has some juice left in it. So then it is taken, tested, and sort of repurposed for a second use application, which does not require as much capacity, and it spends its lifetime there. And then, of course, after a while, it's finally dead. And again, it's taken out, and then recycled or regenerated and put back into the um, loop. And uh, it can be used again for the next generation of uh, applications. And uh, there are three ways to do this. One is the first two, pyro and hydrometallurgy are well-established techniques. And the third one, direct regeneration, is something that's still in the lab scale. Uh, I'll just give a brief introduction on all three of them. So pyro and hydrometallurgy, as the name indicates, are metallurgical processes. They're used for the primary extraction of the metals, such as lithium and cobalt. And uh, the same techniques are sort of repurposed for uh, recycling endeavors, where we use the same principle to extract the metal from spent or uh, used lithium-ion batteries. And um, 
right now there's a concerted effort to move away from pyrometallurgy because although it's a uh, simple and uh, relatively easy to implement this method, it is very energy intensive. It requires temperatures in excess of 1,000 degrees, around 1,200. And uh, of course, uh, a lot of the metallurgists lost a slag, so this is not the most efficient. Uh, the other method is hydrometallurgy. This uses uh, chemicals to achieve metal recovery or reclamation. However, again, this is a much more uh, complex process, so uh, it requires multiple steps than pyrometallurgy, uh, albeit being uh, uh, possessing a higher efficiency. And uh, the third one is called direct regeneration. Now, these first two methods, pyro and hydrometallurgy, they're called destructive methods. So essentially, they destroy the uh, active material while they're doing the metal recovery, and you need to uh, put a process to sort of bring it back to battery grade. Direct regeneration eliminates that step. So essentially, uh, okay, before I explain direct regeneration, uh, one of the reasons why your battery dies is that, as Matt explained, a lithium-ion battery works by lithium shuttling back and forth. And some of the lithium gets stuck while it's shuttling and the active the amount of active lithium sort of reduces so direct regeneration looks to replenish that active lithium using certain techniques and directly regenerate it and be used it for a second generation of batteries so this eliminates a lot of steps that, like uh, purification and separation steps involved in uh, pyro and hydrometallurgy however it's still in the nascent state it's still experimental it's not um, uh, industrially viable at the moment uh, so my lab is working on uh, uh, hydrometallurgy and direct regeneration, and my research is uh, sort of uh, focused on that as well. So uh, this is essentially what I'm working on. So a battery has two parts, the anode and cathode, the positive and negative. And uh, for the anode, it's usually the, the mineral graphite that's used. So my research focuses on taking the uh, used or spent graphite and sort of uh, purifying it and regenerating it. And, uh, and I'm trying to upcycle it as well. I'll get to upcycling in a bit. And uh, in terms of the cathode, I'm trying to reclaim the uh, spent uh, uh, active materials, uh, the lithium in the active material, and uh, sort of use it for the next generation of batteries. And I'm using a green approach, which means the chemical comp uh, composition that I'm using to uh, reclaim the lithium is much more environmentally friendly than the uh, traditional method used in industry. And um, uh, using uh, the hydrometallurgical methods and my uh, 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 chemical composition, I was able to achieve around 80% uh, lithium recovery from uh, spent uh, cathode material. And I'm sure uh, as the trials progress, I'll be reaching closer to the 100% mark. And at that point, it will be easily scalable since the infrastructure for this technology is already there. I'm just changing the uh, chemical composition of it. So this has immediate industrial applications. And for the anode, I was able to uh, completely purify the anode and get it back to battery grade. Uh, there's a lot of uh, technical stuff involved in that. I won't uh, go deeper to it. And uh, yeah, upcycling. This is something interesting that my lab has been working on. So this is upcycling of the cathode. This is what my predecessor uh, has been working on. I'm uh, taking his uh, research forward. So what he so part A and B is typical recycling methods like the ones I've discussed earlier. Part C does the recycling with an extra step. It's involved in upgradation. We are recycling with an upgradation, so we're upcycling it. So what my uh, predecessor did was uh, he used uh, he recovered the uh, spent active material in the cathode and he doped it with the metals uh, nickel and manganese and created a battery with a higher capacity. So, for instance, if the original battery could say uh, um, can achieve a capacity of, say, 160 units, his upgraded active material could achieve around 200, which is a significant improvement. It's an upgradation while recycling. And, uh, but this is still an experimental uh, technology. So uh, uh, right now I'm working on the uh, uh, anode part of it, like trying to upgrade, upcycle the graphite, and uh, it's still a work in progress. And uh, yeah, before I conclude, uh, this is something I came across recently. Uh, so one of the major challenges for uh, recycling endeavors is the sourcing of the spent batteries. And uh, previously, especially in Canada, there's responsibility was on the consumers or the taxpayers, and the governments took the incentive to recycle it. Recently, uh, Alberta uh, passed this uh, extended uh, producer responsibility program, where the onus for recycling has been sort of move towards the producers themselves. So they'll get a quota and they'll have to recycle this much amount of it to stay in business or have to pay a hefty fine. So this extended producer responsibility is something that has uh, worked in Europe and uh, in Japan. So uh, I believe uh, it offers a lot of uh, promise. And I believe Alberta is one of the first provinces in Canada, if I'm not mistaken, to uh, implement this. So it's, uh, it's very exciting. Yeah, thank you for listening to me, and I'd like to thank uh, Future Energy Systems for uh, and uh, my uh, professor, Dr. Zhao Li Wang, and our group, uh, Nanoface Lab, for uh, uh, 
uh, helping me with the research and providing all the support. So, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm excited for this discussion. I think we're going to have a really good conversation around this. So I'm going to jump in first because that's I have the mic. Uh, so my first question, so my background is in land reclamation. So the idea of having to do less mining sounds great. Uh, how does the cost compare between mining new materials versus recycling? Are they equivalent? Is one cheaper? Is the economic side something we can use to encourage this? Right, so that is an interesting question. I asked a similar question during uh, another presentation, so I had the same, same doubt. So recycling presently is uh, three times expensive than mining, so the incentive to uh, recycle is sort of less. However, you have to factor in another aspect. So when you're mining, you need a, a large area, and you're getting uh, more lithium from that larger uh, production space. However, here, the concentration of the lithium in a battery is much higher than the concentration you get in, for example, from a brine. That is an advantage. So I agree, cost is one thing you have to look at. But if you look at uh, other factors, then uh, it could be a bit more, how do you say, a viable alternative. Also, uh, in terms of handling, one of the uh, proposals, like the organic mixture, the, the uh, chemical mixture that I'm using, one of its advantages is that it reduces... Uh, handling costs because it's a milder chemical as opposed to sulfuric acid or something. So it reduces, it uh, results in cost savings. So essentially, uh, research like this kind of helps to bring down the cost from the three times to, I would say, comparable values. Also, there's another aspect involved, the logistics of it. So if something is mined in one area, say in Australia, and it's uh, manufactured in China, the transportation costs should be factored in to that. So if you have a recycling facility right beside, a, say, a battery production facility, what we call a sort of a vertical integration of sorts, then you eliminate the logistical cost. So at base, if you look, even if it's three times more expensive, if you take all the other parameters into concern, it could be a much more uh, efficient route, I would say. So yeah, that's actually a very good question. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're going to bring that up more in the, uh, the group discussion at the end. Uh, anyone have any additional questions? for this exact moment. Yes. You mentioned that the chemical mixture you're using is, is milder. What exactly is that mixture? And is there any concerns about having enough supply of that chemical mixture? Right. So uh, I won't tell you what the mixture is because the research is ongoing. But I will say it's an organic uh, acid mixture. Uh, so typically in industry, they use mineral acids such as uh, hydrochloric acids and sulfuric acid. And they're incredibly corrosive. So what I'm uh, trying is a, a mineral, uh, organic acid mixture. And organic acids, as we know, is uh, like the citric acid we have in uh, uh, fruits or something like that. So they're comparatively milder and easier to handle. And of course, they're much cheaper because uh, it's yeah, readily available. You don't need much processing to get it. So yeah. There's, and also, there's uh, I forgot to mention, there's cost saving involved in handling as well. Because if you have sulfuric acid in a pipe, scaling and corrosion happen and you got to repair it, these acids, uh, the, the chemical mixture that I'm using, uh, that is eliminated. So another advantage. And of course, they're biodegradable because they're organic. So yeah. Awesome. Lots of nodding and curious faces. All right, last question for now, and then we'll do a little room change. Uh, so Kenneth wants to know, does the infrastructure to assess the partially spent uh, batteries already exist. You talked about assessing those batteries to be repurposed. Does that, does that technology infrastructure already exist? And does it exist at a scale for all of the electric vehicles on the road? Like, can we do this process now, or do we need to build up an infrastructure? Um, I would say infrastructure support is required, but I believe in uh, a micro scale, it is still being done. But however, it is a bit aspirational. So this is much more. A, a theoretical application, I would say. But uh, in, I would say, lab scale, this has been uh, achieved as in it repurposed for a secondary application. So, yeah. But of course, we do need a, a robust infrastructure for all of these to happen. And that's why the uh, ERP I mentioned is like one step towards a circular economy. So, more government incentives in this area will kind of ensure that this happens. Awesome. Sorry, I couldn't tell if my mic was on. Uh, wonderful. Well, another round of applause for Anil. Uh, okay. Awesome. So, big round of applause for our speakers again. Thank you both so much. So, this space is for you. 
pit them against each other, ask them joint questions, really delve into the world of batteries, how we use them, what do they look like in the future, how do we recycle them. This is your space to ask anything you want of these researchers and they'll do their best to answer. Please don't pit them against each other. I mean, like you can if you want, I guess, but uh, they're really nice people. All right, are there any questions or should I start us off? Yes. Uh, this is to Matthew. Um, what's, how big are the batteries that you're working with gonna be when they're in commercial production, say in cars or in grid scale? That's a great question. Um, so working alongside my previous discussion about how it's got a more higher energy density because you don't store the air, you just store the zinc. Um, the same energy you can probably get, I would say about half or so the size of, of lithium ion. So yes, right now, uh, electric cars are just filled with, with lithium ion batteries, the whole floor. Um, we, ideally with zinc air batteries, you would need a lot less. Um, so it, it, there's that obvious benefit. Awesome. Thank you so much. Anyone else have a question? So I have one for both of you and I'll get you to start because it kind of leans into your research. But incorporating all of the costs associated with an energy technology from production to recycling, kind of that life cycle assessment, that circular economy, seems like a really logical idea. How do we bring that more into everyday technologies? And then Matt, I'd throw it to you to, how would you incorporate that? Um, to start off uh, right off the beat, so when the battery module is designed, uh, it's designed for an application. When we're trying to recycle it, we sort of have to destroy the casing, take it out and, uh, uh, you know, again, do the recycling process and build it back up again. So if you have sort of a modular design where we can have an automated assembly line where we take a used battery sort of fit it in and, and a robot's kind of disassemble it, do the regeneration, kind of put it back together. That is sort of how, um, you know, we can make use of economies of scale. This would be a more efficient process. So something along that direction. So the problem with that is the design has to be changed uh, from the onset at the first scale itself. So it requires a, co a cohesive effort from, um, for example, like battery manufacturers, uh, the middlemen, uh, the uh, producers uh, of the um, appliances themselves. So for example, if a battery is produced for car applications, it has a certain shape. So when we are repurposing that for recycling, then the car uh, space for the battery should be changed as well. So the whole, uh, uh, I would say the production line, production chain uh, should, should sort of adapt towards that. So once we're able to comprehensively achieve that, then we can have an efficient circular economy, which is of course cost, uh, cost effective and uh, 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 we can benefit from uh, all the other uh, environmental savings as well, such as uh, low greenhouse gas emissions and uh, things like that. Awesome. Matt, I am going to throw it to you, but just to jump in on that a little farther, how do we get there? How do we convince people to do that? How much of it is we need to focus on the money, we need to focus on communication, it just needs to get out there? What, what do we need to do as a community to kind of get that to the next step? Um. Big questions. Yeah, that's, no uh, small questions at Energy Talks. Um, I would say the uh, two-pronged approach. So starting off the uh, policy side, as in uh, policymakers and governments say, they should have uh, outlined uh, something for this. For example, in the EU, they have uh, these uh, uh, WEE, Waste Electronic and Electrical Equipment Directives on the collection sourcing of sp uh, spent ones. And of course, the ERP, Extended Producer Responsibility that I was talking about is in place so the manufacturers if they want to operate there they do have to uh, source and recycle it themselves and of course there's incentives for uh, putting spent batteries i think uh, when you buy it you have sort of a you pay sort of a deposit and when you put it for recycling uh, you get some money back so incentives like such as that so i would say that's one step closer towards that but again it's on a smaller scale it's just europe so north america does not have anything like that at the moment so uh, once we have that policy in place, and then second, of course, the infrastructure comes, for example, collection points for spent uh, batteries or things like that. So I would say, yeah, once the policy part and then the technical part come together, then uh, we can create something efficient, I would say, yeah. Awesome. Uh, and Matt, what about you? When you think about circular economies, kind of that life cycle assessment, how does that kind of relate to your work? Oh, well, not so much my work, but I think just in general, uh, this problem, this, this issue of circular economies, uh, with all technologies, like plastics, for example, right? 
people, we just made for plastics for crazy and we started using them and we threw them away and we didn't care because we had so much more abundant raw material for making it. We didn't care about where it went. And it's the same idea with all technologies. And now we're now realizing, oh, dang, we should, you know, we should recycle these, we should reuse these, we should avoid unnecessary production. So with the zinc air battery specifically, uh, I mentioned zinc more abundant. So I'm almost afraid that we think, oh, we don't need to recycle it. We have plenty of it, right? So I agree. When we have new technologies, we need to have those infrastructure or the policies in place to kind of enforce recycling and reusing and being a responsible producer, a responsible user, responsible, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think it's not just with batteries. Batteries are just a, the next technology we have in a long line of technologies that need to be recycled or looked after their full life cycle. So that's kind of more of a, an ongoing approach now in, in research. We, people are realizing we should look at the full lifespan of anything, regardless of it's abundant or not. Awesome. Thank you. Hope for the future, right, everybody? All right. Audience questions. Anything else you are interested in knowing? Okay, I see you and then you. So I'm just this is a question from Matt. How many years are you looking at until your batteries are in commercial use? It's a very good question. Um, it's a very hard question to answer as well. Um, somebody asked me that one time. I think I said five or ten years. Um, and do I stand by that number? I mean, I wouldn't bet on it. But uh, right now, there are companies looking at zinc batteries. There's actually commercialized units you could buy for um, powering a home. For that thing. So. People are working on it right now. They really want it out there because it is so so cheap and accessible. Um, but it's not as widespread as lithium ion. But lithium ion went from research to production over like 50 years of research. And zinc air has only happened in the last 10, 20 years. So will it be as widespread as lithium ion in the next 10 years? Probably not the next 30 years, maybe. Um, but there are some applications, like I said, some companies right now making zinc air batteries. So it's it's slowly making its way in, but I, I wouldn't hold out for it. Awesome. Thank you for your question. Thanks. This is to both. Um, what um, what else is going on in, in, in research in your areas that's sort of different from what you're doing, but parallel to and trying to same, solve the same problem in different ways? So uh, would you like to start and then? Yeah, sure. So as I mentioned, um, so uh, cobalt mining has some ethical issues associated with it. So there's a uh, uh, concerted effort to move away from uh, the typical battery. So uh, we're looking at, uh, say, nickel uh, uh, dominant batteries or uh, cobalt free batteries. So that is one interesting research in that area. Also, there's alternatives as well. So um, instead of electric uh, uh, vehicles powered by lithium ion batteries, uh, fuel cell electric vehicles. So they're powered by hydrogen uh, power. So that is something that's happening uh, parallelly as well. So they have, I think, so the constraint for lithium ion battery is. Um, its range uh, for an electric vehicle, it can't go far. So I believe fuel cells can kind of uh, um, help with that. But then again, the cost parameter comes. So to industrially uh, get hydrogen, it is much more uh, expensive. And of course, the safety concerns and that as well. So these are like alternative technologies, I would say. So yeah, so I believe in terms of EV fuel cells and in terms of uh, reducing cobalt dependency, nickel dominant uh, uh, batteries. Thank you. I like that you mentioned uh, fuel cells. I think yeah. that's also a very interesting application uh, or a kind of tangent to batteries, right? Mm -hmm. Everything's about batteries and fuel cells, actually zinc air batteries are kind of a hybrid between a fuel cell and a zinc air and a battery. Because batteries in generally are contained, like lithium ion batteries, completely contained. There's no access to the, whatever isolated st structures. Fuel cells work by having two fuels in and then a water byproduct out. And the zinc air batteries are kind of half. We got the contained zinc, but the oxygen in and out. So it's kind of a hybrid. So I know some work about uh, uh, fuel cells as well. Um, now, when I'm talking about my research, uh, I'm looking at just that air electrode and performance of that reaction. When I'm talking about a zinc air battery, there's a whole other electrode, there's a whole zinc electrode that I don't even look at. And other researchers are looking at, okay, is there issues? And there is issues. You go back and forth recharging, the zinc changes shape and it can get in the way. It could discharge, it can, it can uh, short circuit. So that's what people are looking at. So when I talk about 60% efficiency, it's not just that air electrode. We're also looking at our zinc. Can we get that going for a long time as well? Um, so that's another aspect that's kind of tangent to mine. But I definitely think that uh, fuel cells are also a, a good uh, application. And I think really in the future, it's not going to be lithium. Like lithium on batteries right now are ubiquitous. Everybody knows about them everywhere. But I think in the future, we're going to have 
niche applications for each technology, right? We probably will keep using lithium ion batteries for our phones for the near future because it's enough power for what we need. But we're talking about cars, like you said, it's just kind of getting really weird now, a lot of batteries, whereas fuel cells can reduce that. So maybe cars will use fuel cells instead. And then maybe my zinc air batteries will be better for the power grids, right? Stabilizing that because we have it stationary and maybe that's better for it, right? So I think it's gonna be multiple technologies. Also like variations of the lithium ion batteries themselves are happening. One of my colleagues over there, she's working on lithium sulfur batteries. So it's using a sulfur host for um, the benefits it applies. So there are deviations from the base technology as well. So those are some interesting research that's happening. Thank you so much for that question. Yes. Um, in your presentation, you um, pointed out that the efficiency of the uh, zinc battery was was only about 60%. Doesn't this bother you a bit? For sure, for sure, it, I mean, it, it does. I mean, you, especially when you look at lithium ion being 90, 95, you know, you're like, yeah. why well, can't compete to that, right? You see these numbers. But uh, when one thing, we're talking about higher energy densities. So yes, 60%, but if you convert that into the energy kilowatts per charge, we're looking at maybe you know 20 units versus 30 units because it's just so much larger, even though it's only 60%. So they got to think about that as well. Um, um, and um, it, yeah, it, it is because of the, the different reaction. Like I mentioned, the nucleation, the back and forth is so simple, right? Whereas mine's a chemical reaction. Um, so that 60%, it's kind of almost like, well, it's what we got, we got to work with it almost. So, it, um, so are you seeing any in, increase in efficiency with your catalyst? Or? Um, marginal, I'd say. Yeah. We're not getting any leaps or bounds just quite yet. Yeah. Um, it's going to be a combined effort also on the zinc side and in the liquid electrolyte side, all working together to make it a really good uh, enhanced, maybe working together. Maybe the zinc can enhance the catalyst, the, the air electrode. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but I don't think we're going to get up to 90% with zinc here ever. I think that's kind of restriction because it is that electrochemical reaction. It's such a big involved reaction. That's just kind of what we got to work with. Um, well, but it's okay. Well, this is a huge problem with the dendritic growth of zinc metal perforating a well into the electrolyte and yes. short circuiting. That's a huge problem too. I mean, all these, and then there's the whole. It, you have to step back and look at the whole process and look at the energy you're wasting with only sixty percent efficiency, uh, a very low life cycle. Um, why are you still in this research? Why aren't you doing something with? Uh, with a solid electrolyte or like the, you know, glass battery that right. good enough invented. So. Well, I, we're talking a uh, big uh, arm of my research has been the stationary application. And that's when we have renewable energy. So technically that energy is kind of free. So if we're only at 60% of it, it's not a loss per se, because it is renewable. And so anything is better than nothing. And just well, it, it's it is a loss because you have to build a bigger supply of energy you know more windmills have to go up more solar panels i i, I challenge you on that so, right so. um that's a good point i think also the attractiveness of lithium or zinc air uh, is the inexpensiveness and the safety of it so yes zinc or lithium ions might have longer lifetimes or um more better efficiencies but they have their hazards associated with them like we there's been a, quite a few facilities that have created big compounds to store energy for the grid that have caught fire recently because the lithium ion technology is just so volatile. Whereas zinc air, that would not happen. Well, that's why I'm talking about solid state battery. That right. It doesn't burn the way you suggest with the uh, liquid electrolyte. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, leaving in zinc air, we're looking at solid state electrolytes because um, what about if you want to have it for your watch, for example, you don't want to have water sloshing around, mm -hmm. but we're working on using polymers or plastics as that electrolyte as well. And there's a lot of uh, big research in that as well. Yeah. I'd also comment that the cheaper the battery is to make, the less likely it's going to be recycled. At all. I, I alluded to that earlier too. Yeah, probably would be a concern. Um, but that's going to be a, a an issue just like plastic, right? Plastic has done wonders. It's changed our life with plastic, but it has been wasted a lot. And so we need to be ahead of the curve and add government regulations and other things like that, incentives, before you make it commonplace. So it's a combined effort of everybody. It's not just the scientists, I think. Uh, to add on to that, the cost uh, part that you mentioned that since zinc is cheaper, it's easy, uh, the incentive to recycle is, uh, and it's abundant, the incentive to recycle is not much. 
However, as I mentioned earlier, like uh, the logistical cost is often not factored in. So suppose you have a battery producing industry and they collect all their spent batteries, they reduce the uh, middleman's uh, sort of thing. So that's an incentive for the company itself to do it. And if it's, uh, I would, even if it's not cheaper, if it's compatible to mining, and of course the uh, um, now companies are going to go and green themselves, uh, you know, to market themselves as sustainable so that people will buy their product. That is another incentive for the company themselves to take it up. So okay. although it's abundant and it's cheap, uh, there's not much of an incentive to recycle. The other factors might uh, prompt them to uh, recycle. Also, often, of course, environmental responsibility is a big thing in uh, for most uh, com- up and coming companies as well. So I believe that can kind of circumvent uh, that you. issue. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. So I'm going to ask the dreaded thesis question of you have an endless budget and as much time as you want. What's your next research question that you're trying to answer in your field? You go first. <laughs> what? That wasn't prepared for this at all. Um, well, my research group has been like very focused on zinc air for a long time. We've done a lot of research. And I'm one of the last students working on zinc air. And most other people have moved over to zinc ion. So like lithium ion, but using zinc rather. So we don't have to worry about the issues with lithium, but rather use the benefits of zinc, but still be ion with high, simple electrical uh, reaction so that we have higher efficiency. So we don't have to worry about that 60%. It's more along 95 is what we see with lithium ion, but we're using zinc. So zinc, air, or zinc ion is a very relatively new technology. Um, and so that would be really what you'd want to dig, sink your teeth in to this brand new technology that's, maybe five or 10 years young compared to a more established technology. So that would be really what I, I want to go with, is the zinc ion. Um, yeah, so I have uh, two things in mind. One of them is, as the gentleman mentioned, uh, solid state batteries, where there's absolutely no liquid involved, which is uh, which uh, kind of bypasses the safety concern of lithium ion batteries. That's one interesting aspect. The other one is non-metal batteries. So like zinc and lithium ion batteries, there's a metal involved. Uh, now, uh, sort of focus is going towards uh, uh, batteries which has no metals involved. So the uh, uh, the ion that is shuttling is uh, a non-metal, such as an ammonium ion. So I think these are the two, uh, I would say, future questions that I would like to answer to achieve non-metal uh, batteries and to uh, have uh, liquid-free batteries. If that's one way to put it. Also, I, I'm an advocate for fuel cells. So if I would try to help the fuel cell research get that out of there, because I feel like that that is also because I, I was learning somewhere that if you take hydrogen, you can burn it in oxygen, produces heat, use that heat to then boil water, boil the water to then produce steam, steam produces a turbine, gives the electrical energy, right? That's a series of reactions. We've lost energy every single time we convert between energy sources. Taking hydrogen and oxygen in a fuel cell is a direct conversion from chemical to electrical, one of the highest efficiencies you can have. So I think fuel cells are a good uh, technology in general. Awesome. Thank you. I'm just preparing you all for your thesis defenses. It'll definitely be a question you get asked. It's coming. All right. Are there any other questions? I'm hanging out in the back of the room now. Anyone over here got questions? You've learned a lot. Okay. I have another one from Kenneth. our Google Doc. We just send each other questions on here. Uh, Matt, do things like altitude and airflow affect zinc air battery efficiency? Do you need to force air into the battery to make sure it generates enough power? That's a great question. Great concern. Um, yes, it would, it would affect the oxygen concentration. Right. So we need to have a certain amount of oxygen coming into our battery uh, and going out. Um, right now, my batteries that I work with are just uh, ambient air. So we let it come in by itself. Some places, some people will force oxygen in and they will increase their efficiencies, right? So they'll get above 60% potentially. Um, but we don't compare, like we're comparing apples to oranges at this point because they've changed a big aspect of it. Um, and altitude, I guess, would be doing co- oxygen concentration in the air, which you'd again, you have to concern about. You're right. Um, so maybe planes are the best location for zinc air batteries. Um, um, but another thing that you looked at is what if we just contain oxygen? Like, yeah, I said a big uh, benefit of zinc air batteries is that we don't restore oxygen, it just comes and goes. But what if we just had a tank of pure oxygen that went in and out? And an application for that would be grid scale, right? Things that are stationary, not moving. So if we had a power plant and we had a tank of oxygen with our zinc, then we could get pure oxygen and we could avoid issues with like CO2 in the air, which is causing some problems or uh, um, uh, evaporation or dehydration of our cells. So um, that, yeah, oxygen 
is a concern. That's one of the many aspects of a zinc battery. All right. Do you guys have any questions for each other? You're up there. I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, it's okay if you don't. I'm just giving you space. You're good. Awesome. Okay. Last call for questions. Or we are doing our last one. Okay. So make sure I don't miss any hands. Awesome. Okay. So the last question, what is the biggest misunderstanding related to your research that you want to clear up right now? You have 20 people in this room to be your advocates. What is the biggest misconception that you want these folks to go out into the world now knowing the truth? Wow. I know I keep giving the really I, I hard question. I would say I can't take what I make in the lab and put it in my phone and start charging my phone with it. Um, research is very compartmentalized and we work on individual aspects at a time. Like I mentioned, I'm looking at just the air electrode. We mentioned there's zinc problems with dendrites. We mentioned there's oxygen problems with concentration. So it's hard for me to, 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 to take what I have in the lab and power my car with that or whatever you know, application you have. So it's kind of like, oh, so you're making batteries, you know, oh, when are you going to see yours in the market? Well, I'm sorry, I'm not making commercialized batteries. I'm looking at trying to fix one of many problems. So it's, it's a combined effort. And if you know recently the, I don't know, maybe a few years back, the Nobel Prize in chemistry was given to the three guys who were instrumental in lithium ion battery technology getting how where it is now. So it's not one person, it's not Einstein, it's going to be a bunch of people working together. And I'm one of many uh, giants who have st stood on their shoulders to get to where I am. So unfortunately, no, mom, I can't make a battery for your uh, car. I'll just sort of add on to that, actually. So as researchers, what we're doing, so I'm doing my uh, master's. So it's a two-year program. Um, he's doing his PhD, which is average four to five years. So that's the only time we spend on, say, a particular type of research. So we do one aspect of it. So right now, I'm just kind of carrying forward my predecessor's work. So like uh, Matt mentioned, it's an accumulation of things. And much of it is uh, trial and error. So a question that was posed is why he's working on zinc air batteries when a better one is available. We are trialing that. And if it doesn't work out, we move on to the next one. So research is mostly just, uh, uh, especially fundamental research is taking things, mixing, matching up, see how it works out and hope to, you know, strike up on something. So it's not always a result oriented uh, uh, thing, research. That's, I would say that's a misconception. Where, like people ask, what's the motivation for your research? It's uh, it's fundamental. We're trying to figure out what it is. So yeah, we're, we're doing new things. That's new. all about research is new. No one else, no one else has done it. So we don't know what's going to happen. Right? Exactly. There is no objective yeah. at the moment. Yeah. yeah, the objective is finding what happens. Right? The scientific method of, you know, exactly. Yeah. Like I know people who have completed the entire thesis, and the, what was the answer? It didn't work, <laughs> right? That's that's two years of research. It didn't work. Don't do it again. That's about it. So, but that's that's just the nature of research and uh, of the cutting edge. Yes, of course. Absolutely, seven-year PhD takes a long time. Research is long, uh, but I think that's a great place to end it.